much for coming this afternoon to the Sullivan Museum and History Center's Lunch and Learn. Uh, I am pleased today to introduce uh, Professor Stephen Sotkin, who will be speaking to you on uh, the horrors I have witnessed. Uh, first, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Professor Sotkin. He is the Director of Studies and War and Peace at Norwich University and has accepted that position in 2007. He's a professor of history uh, in the department and has also been the director of the William Colby uh, Military Library Symposium uh, from 2010 to 11. Uh, Steve has his degree in history, uh, his master's and his PhD from the University of Kansas in American and Military History. And he also uh, is a uh, supporter of, a, of the museum and in many ways. In the past, he's uh, brought his students to uh, exhibitions that we have put on uh, concerning the Civil War. And this particular, uh, this particular uh, Lunch and Learn is actually going to be uh, some new information, which I believe Steve has uh, developed over the past uh, semester uh, he's been on sabbatical. So we are going to uh, hear some new research um, that he has done on the Civil War, and uh, hopefully this will uh, enhance the information that the museum has to put out on the Civil War. Uh, we have one more exhibition, uh, 1865, which will be uh, offered in uh, January of 2015. So if you uh, haven't had a chance to visit, to see the 1864 show, it will be on for the remainder of the year. Uh, at this time, I'd like to uh, ask Steve to help us lunch away. Really an understanding of something intrinsic 
in many documents regarding the war. He wrote in his introduction, when a man has spent a week in toilsome marches toward battle and then faced the enemy when death was hovering in the air, it is not easy for him to forget the fatigue, the hunger and thirst, the blanket bed by the roadside, the hot skirmish on the picket line, the gallop of the battery at a turning point in the engagement. Though these scenes make but little impression on his mind at the moment, they all come back to him in after years. He understood something that, to paraphrase a great author from another war, soldiers have certain things they carry with them that they that transcend the war. The war makes an impact on them that in many ways can't be understood until they've had time to process it decades later. So what I want to do is I want to walk you through one campaign in particular, the Overland Campaign of 1864. Some of the most brutal fighting of the war and show what impact it had on the men then. And then how the survivors tried to comprehend it decades later when they sat down to write their memoirs. Certainly the Overland Campaign was one of, if not the bloodiest campaign in the war. This was a campaign where, where Ulysses S. Grant takes command of the Army of the Potomac. He's the new savior. He's the man, the hero of Vicksburg, the hero of Chattanooga, who's going to resurrect the Union war effort, drive on Richmond, and end the war in one city. Well, Robert E. Lee is still in command of the Army of Northern Virginia, and he has something to say about it. And for six weeks, Grant and Lee's armies engage in a series of horrific battles in between D.C. and Richmond. The Wilderness, Spotsylvania, North Anna River, Cold Harbor, culminating at Petersburg, where the two armies will dig in for a nine-month-long siege. Trench warfare, 50 years before we'll see it in the European theater in World War I. The numbers here are overwhelming. At the start of this campaign, the Union Army of the Potomac had 120,000 men. In six weeks, they lose 54,926, 45% casualties in six weeks. If you include the subsequent Petersburg operations, where the Army suffers another 50,000 casualties, the Army loses 85% of its strength in a year. 85% of the people who kick off that campaign on May 5th, 1864, aren't there or have come back from wounds by April 9th, 1865. And the Army is continuously engaged this entire time. There is no respite. They're either in contact with the enemy or moving to contact with the enemy this entire time. What does this, uh, what effect does this have on these men? Well, a certain more 20th century analysis would suggest that soldiers don't have an indefinite, indefinite period of time where they can be exposed to combat. There is a, a period, there's a time when they will be at peak strength, peak motivation, peak efficiency, but that will decline the further that they are exposed to combat conditions. In World War I, uh, one author in particular, uh, Lord Charles Moran, who was actually Winston Churchill's doctor in the First World War, observed British soldiers in the First World War in the trenches, and he reached the conclusion that it's only a matter of time. Once a soldier enters a combat environment, he will break. It's only a matter of time. As he said, a man's courage is his capital, and he is always spending. No man can go on forever. Sooner or later, all men feel fear. Well, I think certainly the Overland Campaign and the Civil War, this last year of the war, shows that. As the violence increases, 1864 is the bloodiest year. As the engagements grow, as there ceases to be these long periods in between battles, and instead just one constant engagement, the men realize that there is a limit. When will they reach their limit? What happens when they meet that limit? How will they survive? And this campaign certainly puts them to the test. What impact did the Overland Campaign have on this man? Well, it was, it, it was horrific. Uh, it, no words can really describe it. You have battles such as the Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse, where 19,000 Union men are lost in two weeks, 9,000 of them in one 24-hour period. On the morning of May 12, 1864, Grant throws two and a half corps at a very small portion of bulge in the Confederate Union, in the Confederate defensive line. And for the next 24 hours straight, 
those core and the Confederate defenders are engaged in the pouring rain in a murderous slugging match. One, has, one soldier referred to it as a seething, roaring, bubbling hell of hate. Their guns, their black powder weapons could not operate in the rain, so it came down to bayonets and fists. They established positions on either side of the parapet, and they would throw rocks, artillery shells, and dead bodies at each other. It was hellish. Nothing, like, nothing else summarized it. And you listen to how the men describe it, and they realize this was something different. This was something excessive, something beyond anything they had seen at Fredericksburg or Gettysburg. Lieutenant George Bowen of the 12th New Jersey reported, now commenced the most stubborn fight, to fight of, stubborn fight of my experience. It was a hand-to-hand -hand fight. The enemy made charge after charge right up to the muzzle of our guns, only to be repulsed again and again. This continued without interruption all day long until 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning before there was a lull in the fighting. The attacks were impetuous and the resistance stubborn. It was the worst day I have yet seen. Private Wilbur Fisk of the 2nd Vermont, from Montpelier, recorded, this was the most singular and obstinate fighting that I have seen during the war, or ever heard or dreamed of in my life. I can go on and on. Just the superlatives keep coming. They've never seen anything like this. And they've never seen the piles of wounded that begin to grow either. 54,000 casualties, the vast majority of them are wounded. And the army is moving so quickly that it takes time for the medical apparatus to really catch up with it. And so most of the wounded are very poorly treated. They're not gotten to hospital all the time. There was really no effective means. The, the medical apparatus had increased, had gotten better on both sides by 1864. But the, the armies keep getting bigger, the battles keep getting bigger, and they just can't keep up. And so all of the soldiers comment on the wounded, on the mass number of casualties. Private John Arnold of 49 Pennsylvania. It was an awful sight to see the wounded come by in loads. Some had their arms and legs shot off. Some were shot in their heads. Sergeant Daniel Sawtell of the 8th Maine. Those poor boys, so young. And there they were, so many of them on the ground, with nothing but the sky to cover them. There's an implicit feeling in a lot of this, a sense that those poor fellows is that me? Is that my future? Certainly that feeling grows as, once again, 45% casualties. Everybody lost somebody in this campaign. Everybody lost somebody. And that growing sense of loss occurs. The sense that my friend didn't make it. That officer I love didn't make it. That beloved Corps commander, John Sedgwick, shot by a sniper at Spotsylvania Corps House. What chance do I have? And you hear them more in the day. And they begin mourning the dead by counting them. Every soldier counts how many are there. I, you know, just the numbers. Surgeon Nathan Hayward of the 20th Massachusetts on May 22nd, only 250 men left out of 750 that began the campaign. Uh, Private John Arnold found only 42 out of 106 left in his company by mid-June. Corporal William Ray of the 5th Wisconsin could only find 20 men left in his company at the end of the campaign. They look at the numbers and begin to calculate the odds. How much time do I have left? <laughs> After Spotsylvania, Captain Mason Tyler of the 37th Massachusetts is at a roll call, and he realizes that there's one last friend of his in the ranks, and it hits him. I had a deep sense of depression, as if I was being deserted and left alone. My weariness left added much to this impression. And for some, it was the death of a stranger. For some, it was the realization that, you know, somebody doesn't get killed, anybody gets killed in a battle. Austin Kendall, a private in 117th New York. A man was shot in the thigh and did not have proper care and he bled to death. We could not find out what his name was, nor what regiment or anything else that he belonged to. So some boys from our unit went and brought him to where our regiment was and dug a grave and laid him in it. We had a small service. I think that was a little the hardest thing I ever saw. The losses pile up, whether it's strangers, close friends, or beloved officers, the losses add up. And one officer on Grant's staff really kind of captured what this meant 
The men had seen their veteran comrades fall in on every side, and their places filled by inexperienced recruits, and many of the officers in whom they had unshaken confidence killed or wounded. You know cohesion begins to break down as the men you trusted with your life, the men you would follow into hell, are lost. How can they continue on without them? And there's a growing sense of failure, a growing sense that I'm doomed. I'm not going to make it. What am I in it for? Why am I here? You see it sometimes in the odds. Soldiers always like to calculate the odds. Private John Haley in mid-May came to the conclusion, I have a 10 to 1 chance that I will expire before my term does. A Massachusetts soldier recorded, all of us see the frail threads that our lives hang upon more vividly day by day as our little band dwindles away. Or Private John Foote, also of the 117th New York with uh, Private Kendall, the terrible realities of war are now before us, and many of us, no doubt, will be under the side before this campaign travel. <clears throat> they're losing friends. They're becoming demoralized. They're losing, perhaps not faith in the cause, maybe faith in themselves, their own ability to survive. Well, these are all intangible effects. What, what physical effect does this have on how, do, how can we recognize that maybe there's a problem among the manpower? Well, one historian has noted that the Army of the Potomac begins to display serious signs of organi organizational dysfunction during this period of time. Well, that's very fancy. What does that mean? Uh, the Army's falling apart. Desertion spikes. In the American Civil War, it's very easy to desert. Just walk home. It wasn't like in the European theater, World War I or World War II, where you are basically trapped there. You could go home anytime you wanted. Granted, you faced the death penalty if you were caught. But the fact that desertion increases. Desertion from a wartime low in April of 1864 reaches its peak. It steadily increases until it reaches its peak in October of 1864. In that month, 10,692 new cases of desertion are reported, bringing the grand total of Union desertion to 176,000 as of October 1864. Why did they desert? Well. It's hard to determine. No soldiers, when they got caught, ever said, oh, I ran away. If you say that, you get shot by a firing squad, or you get hit. No. And no soldiers after the war proudly record their memoirs, I ran away, absolutely. Didn't happen. So all we really have are the court martial records of those who did get caught and tried to defend themselves. <laughs> One soldier was Private Joseph Reed in the 90th Pennsylvania. In mid-June, he gets caught absent from his unit without leave, dating all the way back to the Battle of the Wilderness, the first battle of the campaign. The charge was that in the most shameful manner, Private Reed abandoned his arms and equipment and deserted his company and regiment. Now, in his defense, he claims that he was helping the wounded off the field, but he can produce no witnesses to verify this claim. However, he does bring several officers to his defense who claimed him to be a good soldier of good character, and that he had served two years in almost every engagement with no previous record of insubordination or desertion. Well, this is probably what saved his life. He gets a 90-day sentence of hard labor, and not the death penalty. Private George Siebert of the 48th Pennsylvania pled guilty to twice deserting his unit in May and, Ju and July. He claimed that he just wanted to see his family. He wanted to go home and see his parents. At the trial, it was revealed that Private Siebert was 15 years old, that at enlistment he had been 14. And so perhaps the court didn't have the stomach to send a 15-year-old to the firing squad. So his sentence ended up being $8 a month, pay reduction. That's out of 13, so that's a lot of money. But their, their explanation for the light sentence <laughs> The court cites the, the defendant's evident youth and weak mental faculties as causation. Another impact other than desertion on the men was indiscipline. Court-martial cases spike over the summer of 1864 in the Army of the Potomac. The men are reacting more vocally to, the, to their officers than ever before. Insubordination, or as they call it at the time, conduct prejudicial to good order and military discipline. Well, some variation on that, I believe. Um, insubordination increases. 
and the military court martial system goes into effect. And there's all sorts of interesting cases, but there's the, the highest number of recorded court martials in the Army of the Potomac is July of 1864. As desertion increases, so does insubordination. 78% of those insubordination cases end up in a conviction. So the Army cracks down. The Army's making sure that they convey it. But this also may convey this notion that we will not tolerate this. But there's also a sense that the men had been pushed, that the men perhaps deserved a little bit of latitude. So while the conviction rate is high, the penalties are not. Uh, Private George Blatt of the 63rd New York is working on trenches around Petersburg on July 15th when his Lieutenant Benjamin orders him back to work from a break. Uh, in a condition that uh, Lieutenant Benjamin would later describe as saucy and impudent, um, Private Black will refuse and take a swing at Lieutenant Benjamin with his shoulder. He has to be physically restrained from assaulting his officer by other men, where he is eventually placed under arrest. At his trial, two things happened. One, all of his officers testified that this was a, this was a man of good character, including Lieutenant Benjamin who had been assaulted. Black was a three-year veteran of the Army who had no prior behavior. Uh, there was an insinuation, but no proof given, that alcohol might have been a causation for that sauciness, perhaps. And as a result, uh, he, is, he is given, instead of being sent to the stockade, stockade or have hard labor for attempting to strike an officer, $6 a month penalty. Now, perhaps the most extreme case, perhaps the impact on the men during this time, the impact of these operations was um, self-wounding. This becomes a very familiar thing in the 20th century. Shooting off a thumb, shooting off a toe, or something like that. It's hard to find in the Civil War, but it did happen. And there, the largest concentration of reported cases of self-wounding occurred at the end of the Overland Campaign. I'll just give you one. Um, while on picket duty in the trenches near Petersburg on June 22, 1864, Privates Wilford, and T Wilford Tucker and Lauren Johnston of the 31st Maine were reported with wounds, identical wounds on the same hand. That's perhaps clue number one. A, a surgeon of the unit, J.D. Mitchell, will examine this wound, and he will report, quote, not only the wound, but the skin for some distance around was filled with powder indicating that the round had been delivered at very close range, that perhaps the, the gun had been, the hand had been placed at the muzzle of the weapon. Uh, this is an open and shut case. Uh, Privates Tucker and Johnston will be convicted of, of self-wounding was the charge, by the way. They had a specific charge for it. They'll both be convicted and sentenced to three years of hard labor at the federal prison in Dry Tortugas, and they will serve out every single, every day of that, of that hard labor. They plead, and when the war is over, they, they ask for a pardon. It is not given. I, I've got plenty of examples. These aren't just anecdotes. These are, this illustrates a trend. Plenty of cases, plenty of examples of desertion. The men are being pushed. The men are reacting poorly. They are physically responding to the traumas that they have faced, even if that results in insubordinate and perhaps violent behavior. But where is the post-traumatic stress? How do we see it? How do we know it's dead? Well, it's difficult. Because a post-traumatic stress diagnosis today depends on observation. It depends on discussion. It depends on not just reading somebody's words, but observing their behavior. We do not have that luxury for civil war veterans. All we have are their words, and the words of those with them. There was no notion of post-traumatic stress disorder in the Civil War, but they had a concept that something, that war did something to them. They had all sorts of words for it. Nostalgia, paralysis, mania, soldier's heart, or just insanity. Obviously, a modern day, of, and by the way, I refer you to the, uh, the wonderful exhibit that actually has a nice display on exactly the defining post-traumatic stress. But certainly the American Psychiatric Association defines it as an anxiety problem. And it includes the symptoms intrusive memories 
flashbacks and nightmares, an avoidance of anything that reminds the subject of the trauma, and anxious feelings that the subject didn't have before that are so intense that their lives are disrupted. Once again, a lot of this is observational. We can't really identify that. But for some of it, we can look at their words at the time and later and see perhaps the birth of those disturbing memories. You can see them saying things that are obviously going to stick with them for the rest of their lives. There is one thing I want to point out before we get to some of this, and that is that the Civil War was different. It's dangerous to draw too many comparisons. There's an excellent book on this subject by Eric Dean called Shook Over Hell, where he compares the experience of Vietnam veterans with that of Civil War veterans. And he highlights several important differences between the Civil War and Vietnam that we might be able to look for post-traumatic stress, but they were inherently different conflicts, and the population were inherently different people at the time as well. But some of the differences he cites are important. One, in the American Civil War, you were 93.2% of all Civil War soldiers were in combat units. 93.2% of everyone who wore a uniform was in combat unit. That is completely different today. That ratio, throughout the 20th century, that ratio goes the other way as the tail grows larger at the expense of the two. So you have a much larger percentage of the armed forces experience, or at least had the potential to experience combat. Something else is that the physical hardships endured by that. I don't want to get into a comparison here whether or not it was harder to be a Vietnam soldier or harder to be a Civil War or World War II or a like that. The only point I'm trying to make is it was different. The physical hardships that they experienced, the marching, the exposure to the elements, certainly impacted them in ways perhaps different from today. And just one example, Colonel George Bernard of the 18th Massachusetts wrote a letter to his his father on May 13th, that really captured a lot of the challenges of the Civil War. This is on a march towards Spotsylvania, by the way, where his unit would get first annihilated. At 7 o'clock last night, pitch dark, raining like fury, and the mud knee deep, we had to march about 10 miles to Spotsylvania. The suffering of the men is almost indescribable. This lasted till this morning, the men falling over at every step as our road took us by woods filled with uncared for wounded howling for help as they heard us groping along, while I saw men in the ranks so utterly wretched that they threw themselves in the middle of the road, wallowing in the mud under the horses' feet, howling and crying like old men. I never knew such a horrible night, all mud, rain, darkness, and misery. These were conditions that obviously were going to stick with these men. Conditions that at the end of this awful, horrible, rainy night march, what did they get to do? charge a defensive position out here. And that's where the battlefield really takes over. The battlefield was different. It was a different mentality behind it. It was an open battlefield. We live in a world, we live in a world today of the empty battlefield, where you don't expose yourself. We're covering concealment of a rule. <coughs> in the Civil War, it was all about exposure. It was all about charging an enemy out in the open. And as a result, you see just these brutal charges over and over again with mass casualties. And what it looked like at the end of it is almost beyond description. But the men try. Second Lieutenant Charles Harvey Brewster of the 10th Massachusetts, by the way, the horrors I have witnessed, that's a quote from him. He described this the day after Spotsylvania. The most terrible sight I ever saw was the rebel side of the breastwork that we fought over today. <clears throat> there was one point on a ridge where the storm of bullets never ceased for 24 hours, and the dead were piled in heaps upon heaps, and the wounded men were intermixed with them, held fast by their dead companions who fell upon them continually, adding to the ghastly pile. When I looked over in the morning, there was one rebel sitting up praying at the top of his voice, and others were gibbering in insanity while others groaned and whined at the greatest rate. It is a terrible, terrible business. Now, certainly the battlefield had a different characteristic, but beyond that, the other differences include really just the mentality behind war. Today, there's a sense of 
I don't want to talk too much about today, but I want to talk about that at the time there was this sense that you are a soldier, you are a volunteer, but if you volunteer and you do not you do your duty, that is on you. You will be held accountable. Perhaps to the ultimate extent. Death. As I said, desertions were not uncommon. Executions of deserters were fairly uncommon. Abraham Lincoln has rightly garnered this, this reputation for being very merciful when it comes to desertions. But large numbers of deserters on both sides were executed. And they weren't just executed. They were publicly executed. Regiments, brigades, divisions would be called out to witness the execution. Something that seems almost unimaginable to us today. One of your comrades being executed right in front of you. And this was something that stuck with almost every single soldier that saw it. Captain Darius Safford, a Vermonter from the 11th, wrote in a letter later in 1864, I have seen death in many forms on the battlefield, but never anything so horrible as to see those men swinging in the air, giving their lives as a penalty for their treason. I could only say it is just, but deliver me from ever seeing anything of that kind as long as I live. So I just, these were things that made the Civil War a little bit different. That made it an atypical example. Perhaps traumas that a more modern soldier might not have experienced. So years later, when they try to process this, when they sit down and write their memoirs, and they had so many reasons to write their memoirs, uh, a need to get it out, a need to, to get those stories down in a definitive sense for history. So many of them were concerned about history. What will history do? They basically were trying to do me a good job, trying to make it so that I would understand what they went through. Some of them did it for money. But all of them, that doesn't necessarily dictate what they wrote. They wrote what they felt. And what's interesting is we see really two main things in a lot of these, and every memoir is different. But two main trends. One, it was glorious. It was glorious. It was, you know, for, especially for the Union, it was a, an almost unparalleled path towards victory. But coupled with that, it was glory. It was bloody. They don't cover up the glory. They almost lot of their ways to describe it, potentially alienating a lot of their readers with these terrible, terrible tales. But let me focus on the glorious one. And it's interesting because. 20 years later, they've had time to think about it, and you know, hey, we won. In 1864, nobody in the army really knew this. They hoped. Maybe a few thought they might. But they didn't know it. In their memoirs, it seemed inevitable. Interesting point. Just one example of this. Uh, the Wilderness, the Battle of the Wilderness, the start of this campaign, is a semi-defeat for the Union Army. But after the battle, the... Grant, very uncharacteristically for a Union commander, decides we're not going to retreat back to Washington, rest and refit. We're going to keep going until this war is over. It's a conscious decision. And the men in their memoirs, in their memoirs, say that this was greeted with enthusiasm. That this was absolutely uh, Major Abner Small, the 16th Maine. Grant was seen, and a great burst of cheering greeted him as he rode swiftly and silently by at its side. Charles Damon, as the army began to realize that we were really moving south, the spirits of the men and officers rose to the highest pitch of animation. On every hand, I heard the cry, on to Richmond. There's this portrayal of the men cheering for the realization that we're going we're to see this through to the finish. We're going to win this war. That's in the memoirs. What's interesting is I've looked at over 200 soldiers, Union soldiers in this campaign, their letters and diaries. Not a single one talks about cheering and grant that the wilderness. Not a one. It's all over the memoirs. 20 years later, yeah, we were cheering Grant, absolutely. At the time, nobody's cheering. What? Another battle? Really? Wow. Just a notion how their memory of the war might have perhaps imperceptibly shifted during the time. They look back on that moment as the sign that we were going to win. They didn't realize it at that point. But beyond the sort of glorious remembrance, there is the dark side. There is the gore. There is the violence. And in their comments, you could see that stuff stuck with them. They could not escape it. 
they needed to express it in some way, but they're obviously haunted by this. They can't get the images of this death and destruction out of their heads. Uh, Captain Mason Tyler of the 37th Massachusetts writes his memoirs in 1912. And he spends pages talking about the gore at Spotsylvania, talking about men chopped to hash, talking about ground soaked with blood, piles of corpses. Another Massachusetts soldier in his memoirs would say the same thing. The putrid corpses, black and festering, lay all about us, repulsive and sickening from which we could not escape. And that's another thing that we see in the memoirs. No escape. There's no escape. We have to see it through. We have to see it through to the end. Now, it sounds like a self-imposed, I'm going to win this thing, but there's also a perhaps darker side of that, and that's we had no choice. We have to keep going. There's a feeling of powerlessness attached to these descriptions of gore. Private Robert Eakin McBride of Pennsylvania talks about Spotsylvania. The tents were not sufficient to contain the wounded, and they lay on the ground on the outside by the thousands. Those long suffering forms, gashed and mangled in every conceivable manner, told a dreadful tale of human wrath. Writes that in his memoirs in the 1890s. Focusing on the wounded, focusing on the cost of it all. Also attached to that, a sense of powerlessness. There's also randomness. The idea that not everyone, but anyone, could have been killed in the Civil War. Uh, Private Frank Wilkinson, the 11th New York Artillery, talks about how uh, a comrade from a neighboring unit came by the campfire one night at Petersburg, sitting around telling jokes. As we laughed, the handsome lad fell face down onto the blanket and began to vomit blood. We grabbed him, turned him over, tore open his shirt, and saw where a ball had entered his side cutting a gash instead of a hole. The wounded soldier did not speak. The blood rushed out of his mouth, his eyes glazed over, his jaw dropped. He was dead. A chance ball had struck the tire of one of the wheels of the number one gun and glanced forward and killed this delightful comrade. His death ended our games. Even 34 years after the fact, this is a story that he remembers vividly. He wants his reader to understand that anybody could have been killed. A chance ball took this delightful person out of his life. And he wanted to make sure that his readers understood it. In conclusion, you know, it's really, I don't think I've given you much guidance necessarily moving forward, but just an appreciation that certainly aspects of the war stuck with them, and aspects of this particular campaign, this particular year, 1864, stuck with them. It's difficult for us to understand who they were. But if we are going to try to look back and look for notions like this and not express, try to understand how they were traumatized by this, perhaps we should look at what they felt at the time and compare it with what they felt decades later. Perhaps we should understand the Civil War was, like many wars, unique, part of a particular time and a particular place fought by a particular people and that it can't necessarily be lumped in with other conflicts. That said, it was war. It was devastating. And as Captain Mason Tyler of the 37th Massachusetts summarized it in the conclusion to his memoirs, human nerves were not made to stand the strain of such warfare as this. To him, the war was something special, but it was also something traumatic, something that perhaps the human condition could not endure, and something he could still not understand decades later. Thank you very much. Happy to answer questions. What time is it? Ten to? Oh, wow, I went on way long. Sorry, but happy to answer questions. Yes. First of all, you gave a fantastic presentation. Thank you. Congratulations. Really appreciate it. Yeah. In those diaries later on, you're talking about post-traumatic stress syndrome. Yes. And you're giving us the reminiscences of, uh, of what occurred mm -hmm. and the relation of events in the past. In those diaries that you read later, Yeah. Was there any indication, too, of the symptoms that people were experiencing at the time? 
uh, besides just talking about relating the board that they had seen? Were they describing anything that they were feeling at the time? If you want to talk about post-traumatic Absolutely. Uh, you know, typically, when you, when you want to look for that, you can see it in a few places. And you focus on uh, the question was, do, do, do we see any of the, the issues that they were facing at the time in their memoirs when they write about them, any of the conditions, perhaps symptoms of PTSD at the time? Um, years later, certainly in the introduction you, and conclusions of their memoirs, you could usually get some sort of meditation on what the war meant to them. And typically, they would wrap themselves in the flag of their respective country and say, I did my duty, I did my service. But occasionally, you would see Frank Wilkinson, who I cited, the artilleryman, uh, he was, he, I would say he is exhibiting sign. He was very demoralized even 30 years later. He didn't know what he had fought for. He didn't want to be there. He did refer to nightmares. That's right. He did refer to nightmares. It's like the dreams of the war still haunt him. So, but the thing is, is that's very rare. Oh, it, is. it is rare. So we have to be careful and say, oh, well, you know, obviously, you know, the, you know, the, very, the soldiers would very rarely say, yes, I'm haunted by the war. They, that's not what men in the 19th century did. And so they would internalize it. Internalize it in ways that would perhaps find expression in other forms. And certainly after the war, and once again, I recommend this book, Eric Dean, should go like, oh, there were hundreds, if not thousands, of cases of soldiers being incarcerated for, they, would, they called it insanity. Typically, their family members would take them to a local asylum or soldiers' home. It's actually interesting. Uh, you look, go and look at the exhibit, there's some discussion of soldiers' home. And just go, we can't deal with this person anymore. You can take it. There was really no system in place other than the asylums and soldiers' homes to take care of the psychological trauma. Yeah, but it's there. And it's been very understudied. Very few people have looked into these records from these homes. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, do you see any, from memoirs or whatever, uh, indication that soldiers that somehow got through all of this and led all the lives suppressed the memories? They were a long period of time. Absolutely. And I do. Yeah. Because I have. I never got any of his written stuff, but it was my great grandmother. Every time she was interviewed by the press in her 93 years after he after died, I said, uh, in the 90s, she never indicated that there was any, ever any issue other than the glory line. Most of this, all the good stuff came out. But none of the bad stuff came out, at least through her. I just wondered if somehow it was auto suppressed. Uh, do, did they suppress the memories that they had incurred in war afterwards? The answer is absolutely. When you look for Civil War menu, memoirs, it's very hard to find any from 1865 to 1875. Nobody writes memoirs right after the war, except for, well, no, Grant, he's right here until the 80s. But uh, they just want to go. They want to go home and put it behind them. But it's only in the 1870s and 80s when there's this growing sense of reconciliation with the South, this growing reaching out and going, you know, we're one country again. That they wanted to maybe express the sense that Reconstruction was a very kind of iffy time. What was the war about? What did we really, what did we really win? What did we really achieve? By the 1880s, Reconstruction's over, they can begin to kind of define the memory of the war and say, well, it was a good thing. I did play a part, and I want people to know what part I played. Absolutely. But until then, they had to endure what would have no doubt been family members. And what did you do in the day? Those questions over and over and over again. And often in the introductions of these memoirs, you get the, you get the you get some sort of comments like, "Well, my family's been pestering me to write this for for years. I guess I'll finally do it." So, yeah. Yes. I would wonder. Uh, that during the uh, anniversary gatherings that started to occur, I don't know when they began, but I mean, I have seen photographs and stories of those gatherings of both the Union and the South mm -hmm. together. I would wonder if that wasn't the time for some reconciliation and healing, also a lot of discussion about these kind of things. I don't know if anything was ever 
Well, increasingly so, yes, because the press gets a hold of these reunion events and they really want to paint this as the country is healed, the country has moved on. In a way, they're painting over a lot of unresolved issues from the war, but that's another discussion. Uh, but certainly, there's a lot of documentation. What's interesting is that the soldiers at these reunions tend to whitewash things. They tend to say, oh, it was glorious. Pickett's charge. We marched proudly. We fought valiantly. They don't get into specifics. They don't recall private such and such getting stabbed through the heart of the bayonet. They don't recall um, an officer being decapitated by an artillery round. They don't focus on the gore. They focus on the glory. They try to maybe suppress the, the violent things. And the only and the only place that you really see that coming out is in the memoirs, where it's perhaps more comfortable. When you're in a room writing by yourself. And so many of these memoirs are never published. Families donate them to archives years later. Captain Mason Tyler's was that. It was never published while he was alive. So all that tale of gore and violence, perhaps he never intended to publish, but he needed it. He needed to write it down. But actually, the reunions, there's so much focus. If you focus on the gore at a reunion, you have to then think about, oh, it was that guy right there who did it. And they can't do that if, if it's going to work. So. Keeping uh, with the theme of memory, do you think that they, they wrote about the gore and the blood afterwards because during the campaign, there was no room to grieve. They had to just bury the guy in the shallow grave you talked about and it was on the bridge, but they actually had no time to form the loss. In a way, you're right, absolutely. They don't have time to process it. They don't have time to sit and grieve. They don't have time to go through the five stages. Uh, they play the blame game a lot. They get to blame rather easily. It's such and such fault. It's Grant's fault. It's Lee's fault. He's the one who's, you know, whomever. But absolutely, it's only when they get home that uh, it's always when they get home. It's only when they get home that they have to run. They no longer have the focus that military life gives them. And they spend 10 years dwelling on it and telling the same stories over and over again, perhaps reliving it. Because so much about post-traumatic stress is not so much that it, you're remembering or reliving. And it's only a matter of time before they have to find some creative outlet for it. And some don't. Some end up in the asylum. Others choose to write. How many others choose to repress? We now have like a concept of, of total war. What sounds like an apt description of that period of civil war. Was that term or something synonymously used to describe that, that period of 1964 and what was going on? Something I'm going to be talking about in my classes later this week, actually. Uh, yes, there was a concept of total war. They used the word total. They used the word complete. They used the word, uh, they didn't have it in the 20th century concept, but just the total for them, I think, was more of an emotional concept. <coughs> it's Spotsylvania, you know, as, this, as that one soldier said, the seething, roaring hell of hate and murder. Um, the hostile feelings within them found expression on a level perhaps they had never conceived of. That I totally hate my enemy. I have no more compunction about killing my enemy. That was something I think they used the word total for. Was that I, unique to that period of 64? 64, yes, I would say so. Uh, everybody had a personal feeling, a personal hatred of the enemy that might have, you know, my buddy here got killed in Gettysburg, my buddy there got killed. But when so many people are getting killed, you have to blame someone. Some blame Grant. You, and that's when he gets the butcher designation. Um, but as one soldier put it, you know, I'm, I'm directing my animosity in the same direction as I point my rifle. You know, it's, you know, the reason why there's so many dead isn't that we have bad commanders, it's that the Confederates can do it. So I think in that sense, total for them was about just an emotion. Other questions? Yes? Uh, could the difference between the you know, memoirs and the diaries also be like a, an initial desensitization? Desensitized initially after like, having experienced it yeah. so quickly, whereas when they're looking at the back, they kind of regain some of their horror. Yeah, I think when they're writing down their diaries, for one thing, they don't have a lot of time to write. They're moving so quickly. They don't, the diary entries are very spark, they're very thin during this time period. And when they do write, it's generally, we had an awful day, 20 killed. That's a, that's a gen general diary entry for this time period. So in a way, they can't really use their diary to process their memories. 
Uh, they have to, they might be thinking about it based on, like we said, they only have time to think. Years later, maybe they're looking back at that, that diary and going, what's going on that day? And maybe that's when it hits them. Maybe when they're putting together their memoirs, they look at their diary, the little notes they wrote in their Bible, or the letters that they wrote to their parents, and went, wow, that's what happened? And it all comes back. But you really have to be careful, certainly, in the immediate response versus the I've had 30 years to think about it. And what's interesting is, when it comes to the cause, they very clearly, 30 years later, know exactly what they fought for. But when it comes to the cost, they can't quite express what it was all about. One more question? Oh, sorry. Um, in your research, uh, one of the questions as I was, uh, the issues as I was listening to you today, um, so we get to Cole Harbor, six weeks of this pounding, 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 casually rate, enormous. Some regiments are, are literally, they're gone for all kinds yeah. of purposes. But uh, when the whistle blows, those regiments pick up, cross the James, and head for Petersburg. In, your, in the research and the feeling, do you get any sense of what it is that, that makes them do that? Yes, and yes, go. Uh, read my book. That's the, uh, it's in there. Uh, that, that's really kind of the whole point of my book is they, the Army's broken into, and for the record, a lot don't. There's many examples when they get to Petersburg of combat refusals, of whole units going, no, charge that, that line? Absolutely not. It is perhaps the closest the Army Potomac ever gets to a French mutiny a la 1970, 1917. Um, but what, what keeps the men going, I think, is habit, um, a sense of, they kept going south. They were getting closer and closer to Richmond. There was a sense that we're, the rubber pushing this, so we're pushing so that rubber wall, so it's just, it's gonna break, it's gonna break, it's gonna break, we have to, we have to do it. And it was only when they get to Petersburg, the initial assaults fail, and the army effectively stops, they dig a trench, they sit in it, and then they think about it. And they have all summer in good Virginia heat to think about it. And that's when they realize, what was that about? What was this? And so that's where you get the insubordination. That's where you get the desertions. Not so much during the campaign. When there's really no time to think about it, or no time to maybe escape it, but when they have time to sit, when they're conducting a siege, all they have to do is sit there. And so that's when it really seems to Yes? Of the figure that you used of uh, about the desertions, how yes. many of those actually were convicted of desertion, deserting? I don't have numbers on that. I just have, I've developed a research sample of court martial records, um, and that 70% figure is based on 212 court martials in July and August of 1864, and 78% of those were convictions. And actually, the, the conviction rate for desertion was higher. It was, that's just all for all court martials. It was 87%, but of that 87%, so a lot of numbers at Of that 87%, 90% were reduced sentences. So they, they sent the message of, if you deserve me, we'll convict you, but we won't execute you or sentence you to years of hard labor. And if you go a little bit further in the pension program that eventually was established for Civil War veterans, were, does anyone know how many of those that deserted actually apply? No. Uh, I mean, there's so much... You know, people always say there's just so much book, so many books have been written about the Civil War. There's so much, and well, you know, maybe we can have one less book on Lincoln and one book to look at something like desertion and Civil War. Something nobody wants to talk about, North or South. The idea, you know, we want to we want to note that our ancestors fought bravely for a glorious cause. The desertion, uh, anywhere from ten to fifteen percent of either army was deserted at any given time. Was absent without leave at any given time. So. Um, the numbers are there. You can check the muster rolls and compare those names to the uh, to the pension records. But no, nobody's done a systematic study of this. Anyway, I, I'm happy to answer questions personally, but I think we need to, to wrap up here. But I just want to thank you. Oh, okay. I didn't know where to be. Uh, all right. I thought, I thought we were under a time crunch here. But uh, all right. I will hog the podium a little bit longer then. Uh, sir, do you have a question?
often forgotten the Civil War is, you know, we have a different mentality today, but just because you served in the Civil War didn't entitle you to any benefits from the government. You got paid. You got paid $13 a month, eventually $16 a month if you were a union. That was your compensation. Don't come back to the government asking for money after it's all over. But gradually there was a realization that's not enough. Uh, widows certainly got pensions and the disabled. If you could prove some sort of disability incurred during the war, amputations, obviously. But what's interesting is that other soldiers would argue less tangible things, like exposure to the elements crippled me in a way. And there were some attempts, some successful, to get a pension for psychological trauma. <laughs> a sense that, and they would claim things like nostalgia or mania as an incurable condition imposed upon them by the war. Now, granted, those pensions were typically something like two dollars a month, so it is not enough. And usually, they were attached to a recommendation that you visit a soldier's home or an asylum to seek treatment. But there was at least a few cases. Once again, not a lot of work done on this. Perhaps there's more. At least a few cases where soldiers were awarded uh, pensions for psychological trauma. Yes, ma'am. I have an ancestor in North Georgia that was taken, he and his father were taken and forced to go to the Confederate Army. They deserted, and the record says, deserted to the enemy. And on his tombstone, it says, a United States soldier. Really? He to fight to the North. So his, service, his Confederate service record says he was a deserter, but on his tombstone, a United States yeah. soldier. That's, uh, the family said he's one that lived in the South and fought to the North. Wow. North Georgia had, a, had more than a few. Uh, North Georgia and North they Alabama had, had all of them. Eastern Kentucky, Eastern Tennessee, uh, West Virginia, as in the current state. Of it. At the time, you know, West Virginia seceded from the state of Virginia. Um, but yeah, North Alabama, North Georgia, Missouri. Uh, I, had, I, had an, I had an ancestor who, uh, who fought in Missouri. I was talking to him in my class today, Amos Augustus Wickersham Fritchie. Awesome man. Uh, and he ends up, he starts as a corporal so as a first lieutenant in 26 Missouri. And what's interesting is he was from around Columbia, Missouri, and you could have picked sides. There were Confederates and Union forces recruiting from that area. But he chose North. And he ended up with a rather distinguished service record. But yeah, in terms of desertion, you, know, you can find service records of the deserters, but a lot of them never, they never saw him again. And after the war's over, they just stopped looking. They, and they, you know, they left it all on the table. There was very few attempts to punish deserters after the war was over. Andy? Um, you mentioned the, uh, the two gentlemen who sell, who wounded themselves and then didn't receive pardons. Yeah. Did the government typically pardon soldiers who deserted? Like, if they, can, if they convicted the soldier of deserting, they typically pardoned them. Uh, after the war, there was a lot of pardons for deserters, absolutely. Uh, the, and that was also part of kind of the federal downsizing is you know, we have all these big prisons. We don't want to keep paying for these inmates. They deserted from an army that no longer needs them. So what's the point? But in the case of T Tucker and Johnston, that was different. That was not just running away, but that was dishonorable in the sense of at least somebody runs away, runs away. Um, you know, they, you know, they, they, they do that. They, you either are there or you do not. But to deliberately wound yourself is a very deceptive, conniving sort of quality that doesn't have the same bearing to it. So yeah, those guys, those guys write to their congressmen, those guys write in Stanton, Secretary of War, their, their wives write, no mercy. No mercy. Their file's huge because of all these letters into 1866 and 67 asking for mercy and clemency. And I'm good. Thank you very much. Thank you.